I'm going to give you a quick review of the first book because that uh, message is already out there. I'm going to spend most of my time tonight talking about the second book and the ideas that have come about uh, in that effort. I'm going to make the argument about the new map. I'm going to give you a sense of where I place the book, Pentagon's new map, in comparison to the debate that's been going on since the end of the Cold War, trying to figure out, in effect, what we're fighting about. Go back to 1989. First really important book on the scene, I would argue, Francis Fukuyama, End of History and the Last Man. And he asked the essential question we've been wrestling with ever since, which is, after ideology, what's the fight about? Now, my old professor, Sam Huntington, put out a marker, his concept of the clash of civilizations, basic, quick, historical tour. He talked about people clashing way back when. Over time, they organized themselves into states. Over time, those states organized themselves into blocks. And voila, we have the wonderful march of history. And this is what we face. So he gives us a point. And on that basis, the debate starts. The debate is <coughs> joined by one of the most influential books I've ever read, Tom Friedman's Lexus and the Olive Tree. And at that point, we got a spectrum, I would argue. My shorthand for Friedman is basically globalization. Some people get it, some people don't. Eventually, everybody's going to have to. You should recognize this message. I like to describe it as fundamentally Marx on steroids. And if you read The World is Flat, Friedman's finally come clean on that thanks to the help he got from Michael Sandel at Harvard, another old professor of mine. Sam's counter to that basically was globalization. Some people are never going to get it. Never. And that's going to be the basis of a lot of fight. What I tried to do in the Pentagon's new map was add a third point to that, and in effect, create a plane. My argument for globalization was, and I'm really trying to combine the economic argument here the social argument here and give a third leg to that stool, political military. Much like Friedman, globalization, some people got it, some people don't. The spread is inevitable. It's been moving for the last 150 years. It gets stuck sometimes. It moves more rapidly sometimes. We can map that process and on that basis we can figure out where the future of war is going. Okay? That's the fundamental premise that underlines the map. Here's the original map that was done for me by Bill McNulty, who at that point was the map maker for the New York Times. This is the one that appeared in Esquire, March 2003. And I love this map because it got me a book agent. <laughs> You're looking at, through 2005 now, about 150 cases where we sent U.S. military forces overseas. I describe this as the natural demand pattern for the exporting of U.S. security post-Cold War. Okay? When I say exporting security, I'm not talking about exporting arms. I'm talking about the time and the attention spent by our forces with regard to any region's potential or actual levels of mass violence. So where mass violence occurred and where we went to deal with it. Okay, all I did was draw a line around 95% of it. The countries on the outside, basically what I call the old core of the West, United States, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, and Australia, and then what I call the new core, or Russia, or China, and India, or Brazil, same four countries that Friedman focuses on a lot, or that argument from Clyde Prestowitz, three billion new capitalists. So my functioning core, as I describe it, basically your old west, your new east, some big players from the south. I call it the functioning core of globalization, roughly two-thirds of the human population, national economies coming together much more rapidly than people realize. Get past some old misunderstandings, some old tailbones from the Cold War. There's basically no reason for these countries to go to war. So the role for the U.S. military fairly latent. We got the biggest gun, that plus nukes, raises barriers to entry to the marketplace we used to call great power war, which we haven't seen on the planet 
since 1945. Okay? Doesn't mean everybody in the core morphs into a middle class. Still plenty of poverty. Doesn't mean they're all democracies. I don't really care about democracies. My argument is, if the government allows broadband economic connectivity between the masses and the outside world, I don't have to worry about that country over time. Because they're going to have to sync up their internal rule sets with the emerging global rule sets that allow that money and that connectivity to flow. We're watching that right now with China. So I don't worry about democracies. Most countries that are going to make the journey are going to do it as single party states, just like Japan did, just like South Korea, just like Singapore still, like a Mexico, like a China and a Russia today. So a functioning core counterposed to what I call the non-integrating gap. And what I mean by that is these are the regions least connected to the global economy. And to me, that's the underlying parameter that defines why there's violence there and why we end up going there so often. Okay? I make an argument. You could shrink this gap. And in effect, I think we did across the 1990s with regard to the Balkans. Okay? So I will argue that the Balkans, in effect, are part of a functioning core now. Doesn't mean they're democracies, doesn't mean there's not a lot of poverty, still a lot of bad blood. It means in terms of direction of change, they are moving towards greater connectivity. Never pretty, typically takes a long time. The mantra from the first book, disconnectedness defines danger. I had a guy from USAID, US Agency for International Development, tell me, I'll tell you exactly, he said, where we're going to go in a global war on terrorism. And I said, really, where? He said, show me a country where we shut down a USAID mission. We'll be invading it about five years later. Because when the United States pulls out the USAID mission, they're saying, in effect, you are so far gone, I'm not even going to bother to try to connect you. And that's like putting a for sale sign out for Al-Qaeda. Because that means the government, in effect, can probably be bought cheaply or simply preyed upon like parasites. So my functioning core, thick with connectivity. In effect, I'm arguing you're looking at the spread of deep connectivity associated with globalization. And these are the areas to which that deep connectivity has not yet penetrated. You'll say, what about the Middle East? It's important because of oil. I'll tell you, it's about one-fifth of the world's population, about 3% of the trade. And the wealth that accrues from that is real. 